My colleagues, Jean-François Montreuil, Olivier Blain, Eric Potter, Jane Percival, Cathy Erig, Jesse Clark, Adrian Fabris, Anthony Dottoni, Hamid Mamin, and myself, Louis Corribo, we would like to provide you an overview of our chapters four to seven from the George Cole Association of Canada special paper 52. Our papers really summarize the metasomatic geological and geochemical footprints of alteration phases as pathways to OCG and affiliated critical metal deposits. We use the superb field exposure of the Great Bear Magmatic Zone in Northern Canada and complement that by a lot of archetype OCG and IOA deposit, including Olympic Dam. In the Great Bear, we were able to map a whole series of mineral system, define and illustrate their various uh, resources, byproduct, enrichment, and endowment in terms of what are the alteration facies that host them using not only the mineral system, but also the nickel iron rich gold cobalt bismuth copper deposit, as well as the Sudayan gold copper silver OCG deposit. Our mapping enabled us to really describe and illustrate and characterize the evolution of the ascent of huge voluminous high temperature saline to hypersaline fluid plumes that somehow collect in the mid crust and then from multiple fluid source with multiple metal source and that start rising towards surface and along fall zone. In the process, metasomatism takes place and fluid rock interaction takes place. It develops consecutive alteration species with continuous recharge and discharge of the fluid plume as far as reaching surface. In the process, any host rocks that is uh, encountered by the fluid plume will be transformed chem chemically and quite intensely and pervasively. For example, this andesite to our lower left is totally transformed into an albitite above a subvolcanic intrusion along 10 kilometers uh, long and about 500 meter uh, thick. In the process, as albite crystallize, anything else that was within that host rock has not been transferred to the fluid plume in order to albite to totally replace the adesite. But this will take place over and over again with distinct mineral assemblage as the physical chemical condition of the fluid plume change, starting with albitite moving on to amphibole or magnetite rich high temperature calcium iron alteration phases, moving on to other alteration phases such as the high temperature potassium iron alteration phases and the low temperature potassium iron. Uh, alteration phases that form iron oxide breccia, among other uh, features. The albitite, this is what we start with, will be formed for, uh, through the albitization of any host rocks, such as these andesite, basalt, and cystone example here, that are totally transformed into a white and then into a pink albitite. Albitite is very porous. It often forms a long fall zone and it can easily be brecciated, forming extensive breccia of albitite. The subsequent alteration phases that form uh, systematically is the high temperature calcium iron alteration phases, where texture can be beautifully preserved or you can totally deform your whole rock as well. Here we start from the left as amphibole dominant, high temperature calcium, uh, iron metasomatite to magnetite dominant alteration uh, assemblage to then folding during the magnetite dominant alteration. While in other parts of the systems or other systems, you could beautifully preserve the texture, such as here, the andesite that I showed you being albitized a few minutes ago, then is now uh, here uh, transformed into 
uh, magnetite-rich ground mass, while the plagioclase phenocris have been totally albitized. After you've produced the high temperature calcium iron alteration facies and all its various mineral assemblage, at the extreme, you may form iron oxide apatite deposits. In the process, you may precipitate primary rare earth and vanadium enrichment, which if they are remobilized, it can form a rare earth deposit, such as the Joseph rare earth deposit in Quebec. If you have sedimentary rocks, then not only can you have formed scorn earlier on, but at the transition from the high temperature calcium iron to the high temperature potassium iron alteration facies, you will form a transitional facies with, that will enable the precipitation of gold cobalt bismuth. This is where you're precipitating a lot of cobalt arsenide, sulfur arsenide, cobalt arsenopyrite, bismuthinite, as well as gold. As the systems evolve towards bitite rich, high temperature potassium iron, you will be starting precipitating copper in, such as in the Nico deposit, or you will form bona fide AOCG deposit with copper and gold in sedimentary rocks, such as the Daangshan deposit in China, or you can form iron oxide breccia with extensively k felspar altered fragments and magnetite in filling uh, breccia with precipitation of calcopyrite, as well as uh, gold and silver and other uh, metal. Now, those alterations are extremely good vectors to the distinct type of mineralization if they are recognized. One has to be aware that albital can resemble and be mapped as cyanide. High temperature calcium iron is known to be mapped as amphibolite, and high temperature calcium iron that is magnetite dominant can resemble and have been mapped as banded iron formation. To avoid those pitfalls, we are providing extremely abundant photos of field and core uh, of all the alteration facies at the regional to deposit scale. We also have a mapping protocol where we don't map individual minerals, but instead it's so variable and it can be looking so complex if you just focus on the single minerals. What we really recommend is to map alteration facies. Then everything gets so much simpler, it's unreal. So all the mineral assemblage that form coevally under the same physical chemical conditions are uh, gathered together under their own alteration facies, which are the ones that I've been describing since uh, now. Each of those alteration facies will have, can occur as vein replacement uh, or can form uh, breccia. And they are to be mapped separately from the protolith but using the protolith as a qualifier. The metasomatic RNL alkali calcic middle systems are really, really extensive at the regional scale, hence their mapping is needed. Now, the same way that the metasomatism has totally transformed the andesite into the albitite, then it will also totally transform the composition of the host rock, the andesite here, into a totally new host rock, uh, a totally new rock composition of uh, consisting of, uh, of albitite. To show that, we use a molar proportion of sodium, calcium, iron, potassium, and magnesium from whole rock analysis. Most inus and sedimentary rock types and most metamorphic rock types as well will contain three to four dominant cations. Those are inus, calcaline, and short genetic suites. This is a whole series of shale. And as you can see, most of them do have three to four dominant cations. Now, once you've transformed your whole rock uh, into a metasomatic rock, then you have reduced the number of mineral phases and you also significant, significantly change the composition 
of the, the rock into that new metasomatic rocks. So albicization will precipitate albite, sodium, aluminum, and silica, which means that the barcodes will be sodium dominant. dominant. If you take Olympic dam, you take your granite, you alter it through potassic alteration, K-phosphor alteration, silicization, you brecciate it, and you gradually in, infill it with magnetite and emetite and gradually increase the emetite replacement. Well, the barcodes will start with the normal barcodes of a granite, gets extremely enriched in potassium, and as emetite become more and more and more dominant, then the barcodes get more and more iron dominant. If you do that for the whole mineral systems, you can see that as you, as the systems evolve, it changed the type of alteration facies and the chemistry of the whole rock dramatically changed as metasomatism proceed. But the same way as sodium is totally decoupled from calcium, potassium, and iron here, uh, calcium and iron is totally decoupled from potassium and sodium, well, the metals that precipitate in association with each of those alteration species will be different. So tungsten will precipitate within the scone. It will be preserved at the high temperature calcium iron. And you're going to form rare earth or nickel uh, or phosphorus and iron deposits. At the high temperature calcium potassium iron, this is where you're starting to precipitate a lot of critical metals in the form of cobalt and bismuth. You can have also tungsten, antimony, tellurium, nickel. And then at the high temperature potassium iron, this is when you start precipitating copper in a big way, as well as some platinum group element. Some cobalt may remain, and you will be precipitating a still a gold, add silver, then at the potassium scone, you can precipitate your lead, zinc, still some copper, some gold, and silver. At the low temperature potassium iron, you'll be precipitating a lot of light rare earth, as well as copper, uranium, gold, and silver. And at the end, whatever was not precipitated will be precipitating. So you may end up with five element veins, um, merlin, uranium, moly deposits. And if you remobilize the primary endowment of your systems, you will form a whole order series of vein times, and again, including vein, five element veins. So to each alteration species, its own metal association and its own deposit types. You're looking for rare earths, the best place is in iron oxide apatite, especially those that are, uh, have been remobilized uh, subsequently. Olympic down, at the low temperature potassium iron, you will have a lot of light rare earth, maybe not as much as the Joseph, you still have a lot, but the heavy rare earth is much lower than what you find in Joseph and other deposits of this type. The gold, now if you compare it to the nickel, will be fairly similar in terms of uh, uh, contents in uh, uh, at the low temperature potassium iron and at the high temperature calcium potassium iron, but the bismuth and the cobalt will be higher at the, potas at the calcium potassium iron alteration species. If you look at the rare earths, another example, if you take all your alteration facies uh, and see how the rare earths evolve, most alteration facies will fall within this range the high temperature calcium iron alteration facies are uh, greater than the other alteration facies. When you go to increase intensity of the magnetite dominant one and form iron oxide apatite, you'll have even more rare earths. And if you remobilize uh, the R from primary endowment like you have done in some of the mineralization uh, in the Great Bear, and that you've done in a big extent at the Joseph, Minville, and Period deposit, then you're starting to have on the rock chondrite diagrams a lot more heavy rare earths than iron oxide, copper, gold, and carbonatite uh, mine, 
while you will have as much light rarer as uh, you would be getting in carbon attack. So one has to realize that we are just skimming the surface here. We're just starting to find all those deposits and it would be very interesting to see what happens in the future. For now, at least, we have a holistic model that really framed the evolution of the mineral system in terms of the various alteration species. We now have a very good idea of the type of deposit that can form at each alteration species, the type of metal endowment that we have at each alteration species. And here, I have put all the critical metals on the Canadian list in blue. Those that are resources, uh, known resources in uh, uh, deposit around the world are in darker and the paler ones are where, where we know uh, significant enrichment and potential byproduct. Now, if you take your ascending fluid plume and make it really smooth towards surface, you may not be forming huge deposits, you're forming mineralization, but you're not going to form huge deposit. What you want is your systems to play yo-yo by adding magma. So each time you add magma, you increase the temperature, which means that you're going to higher temperature uh, alteration phases, start precipitating uh, again the uh, metals that are stable at this uh, phases. On the other hand, if you're adding low temperature fluid, then you're going to be telescoped to lower temperature alteration facies and you'll start precipitating the metals that are stable with those alteration facies. And if you play yo-yo, then you can just continuously increase the amount of metal you're precipitating. I've said that albitite are barren. However, if you, through tectonic disruption, if you're bringing uh, or overprinting of any kind, if you bring in albitite, and overprinted by a fertile alteration species, then you can form albitytos to uranium or albitytos to gold cobalt deposits. Now, we know that albitite forms around regional fault zone. So if you have orogenesis and you really form the endowment of albitite, you can end up having orogenic gold, gold cobalt, orogenic uranium, all sorts of so-called orogenic mineralization within your albitite uh, with your within your albitite corridors. So really, I would like to thank all those who have uh, provided us the opportunity of studying those fantastic systems in the Great Bell Magnetic Zone, but also in other parts of Canada, including the Ramane Horse, the uh, Scadding uh, uh, Deposit, and many others. I want to thank the, the Northwest Territories Geological Survey, who has a big partner into the mapping of the Great Bear, but also all the First Nation, especially the Dene First Nation in the, uh, in the, the Northwest Territories, as well as a lot of mineral companies and permitting ag agencies for allowing us to work in the field and study those uh, fantastic system. And our GAC special paper is awaiting you uh, soon, uh, and we hope that you will be enjoying our chapters. Thank you very much.